Pat Novak, a television personality, begins an edition of his show, The Novak Element, by pointing out that every country in the world, except the United States, is heavily guarded by Omnicorp droids. The scenario moves to Tehran, where an Omnicorp employee named Rick Maddox is handing out red asset wristbands to Kelly Perkins, one of Novak's reporters, and her video team. They witness enormous droids and other robots scanning individuals. Inside a facility, a woman and her child, Navid, observe the droids in operation. Navid's father, Arash, takes a gang of suicide bombers outside to film themselves being killed on world television. They commence their attack, and all of the bombers are slain by the droids, although they manage to take down several of the EM-208 droids themselves. Navid runs out with a knife in his hand and is shot down by an ED-209 on patrol. The camera team captures all of this. Novak goes on to praise the droid's handling of the crisis, noting that Omnicorp CEO Raymond Sellers has the right idea in advocating for the deployment of these droids in the United States. However, Senator Hubert Dreyfus opposes this and has passed the Dreyfus Act, which bans the use of these droids for law enforcement. Novak concludes by expressing his curiosity about why America is so apprehensive about robots. Detective Alex Murphy of the Detroit Police Department walks to a meeting with Chief Karen Dean in Detroit. Two other officers, John Lake and Andre Daniels, also work in her office. Chief Dean chastises Murphy for the events of the previous night. Murphy and his partner, Jack Lewis, were involved in a gunfight with men working for the criminal Lord Antoine Vallon, resulting in the death of six individuals and severe injuries to Lewis. Both Lake and Daniels express their frustration with Murphy for interfering with their ongoing investigation into Vallon. However, Murphy argues that their inability to apprehend Vallon after two years of inquiry implies their incompetence. After Lake and Daniels leave the office, Murphy recounts his version of the events to Chief Dean. The narrative of Murphy is presented through flashbacks. He and Lewis have been working secretly to stop the transportation of illicit weaponry. Against their better judgment, Murphy and Lewis venture to a restaurant to meet Valen. Lewis, concerned about the potential danger posed by Valen's men, insists on having backup, fearing they might become shooting practice targets. However, just as they are about to finalize the transaction, someone betrays Murphy and Lewis, alerting Valen through a smartphone. In a swift response, Valen abruptly leaves the table as a couple of cars pull up outside the restaurant. A group of gunmen armed with pistols and submachine guns storms in, opening fire. Trapped in one of the booths, Murphy and Lewis engage in a firefight, returning fire with their handguns. After a prolonged exchange of gunfire that results in the demise of several henchmen, Murphy manages to escape by leaping through a glass window, landing in an alleyway. In the alley, a couple of thugs are ready to attack him. Murphy advances forward and shoots at the henchman while using a trash can as a barrier. He eliminates two of them and flees on foot with the third. Meanwhile, a henchman hidden in the kitchen breaks out and shoots at Lewis as he is about to follow Murphy. Lewis manages to return fire and kills the henchman, but he is hit in the right shoulder in the process. Murphy stays with him until an ambulance arrives, while Valen escapes. In the present, Chief Dean warns Murphy that he should not undertake such a task without first consulting with her. Sellers is testifying in front of a Senate subcommittee hearing in Washington, D.C., alongside Senator Dreyfus, regarding the use of Omnicorp droids as law enforcement. Dreyfus argues that if a machine kills anyone, even a child, it cannot experience any emotions, and Sellers reluctantly agrees. After returning to Detroit, Sellers meets up with his marketing colleagues, Liz Klein and Tom Pope. Sellers suggests the idea of putting a man into a machine after realizing that more than half of the country's population will not support the presence of robots patrolling their streets. Dr. Dennett Norton and his assistant, Jay Kim, are taking care of a man at the Omnicorp Rehab Center. 
The man had his arms replaced with artificial robotic limbs. Initially hesitant, Dr. Norton convinces him to give them a try. As the man starts playing the guitar with his new limbs, he and his wife are filled with joy. However, the man's emotional levels begin to interfere with the program. He adjusts his tone but confesses that he needs emotions to play. At that moment, Sellers calls Dr. Norton away. Together with Klein and Pope, they assess potential candidates for the Man in a Machine program, all of whom are experienced police officers. However, Dr. Norton and Sellers reject each candidate due to medical or psychological evaluations. Meanwhile, it is revealed that Lake and Daniels, the two policemen whom Chief Dean previously escorted out of her office, are the ones who betrayed Murphy to Valen. They come across Valen at a pub, where he mildly scolds them for not warning him earlier. Valen considers paying Murphy to persuade him to cooperate, but Daniels argues against it, fearing that Murphy would become even harsher on Valen. The two detectives believe it would be faster to simply kill Murphy, although Valen initially rejects this idea due to the increased attention it would bring from the police. Consequently, Valen orders one of his men to plant a bomb in Murphy's car's driver's side wheel well that afternoon while Murphy is visiting Lewis at the hospital. Alex returns home to his wife, Clara, and their 10-year-old son, David. After putting David to bed, when the vehicle alarm goes off, Alex and Clara begin to get intimate. Concerned that the alarm would wake David, Alex goes to switch it off. However, the automobile alarm turns out to be a trap that lures him outside, and the car is subsequently remotely detonated. As a result, Alex suffers severe injuries, with fourth-degree burns covering his entire body. Due to the extent of his injuries, both of his legs and one arm have to be amputated. Additionally, he loses vision in one eye and is likely to experience hearing loss. Dr. Norton and his medical team consider Alex a suitable candidate for their experimental program. Despite Clara's concerns about his quality of life, they persuade her to provide approval for Alex's participation in the program. Three months later, Alex, Clara, Jack, and his wife find themselves at a party. During the event, Alex and Clara share a dance to a song by Frank Sinatra. However, this scene is revealed to be a memory that Norton and Kim are revisiting as they work on completing Alex's new mechanical outfit. Suddenly, they rouse him from his slumber, and Alex is taken aback by his surroundings. Reacting instinctively, he grabs Norton by the throat and throws him down. Kim attempts to intervene and stop Alex from leaving the room, but Norton advises her to let him go. Alex dashes away, running until he can clear the facility's wall and escape into a nearby field. Before they can shut him down and retrieve E him, he manages to elude capture. Back in the lab, Norton confronts Alex and reveals what remains of his body, only his head, heart, lungs, and brain are still functional. Alex is appalled by his condition and expresses a desire to die. Norton informs him that Clara has signed the consent documents, explaining that their efforts would be futile if Alex were to pass away. Alex then engages in a video chat with Clara, bringing a sense of relief to both of them. Afterwards, he watches news stories about his attempted murder and feels disappointed as Valen, contrary to his suspicions, is still at large. Lake and Daniels are revealed to have sabotaged the investigation into his assassination attempt. Alex has completed his training and is now prepared to commence his work with the program. During a demonstration by Maddox, it is shown that Alex's suit is capable of responding to threats by deploying a pistol if required. He is then led into a simulator room where he is positioned alongside a standard EM-208 robot. As observed on a monitor, the robot reacts faster to threats than Alex, who hesitates due to concerns about the potential harm to bystanders. Despite this, Alex employs more tactful strategies. In response, Maddox dismissively remarks, I wouldn't buy that for a dollar. Alex progresses to field training after successfully completing his simulator training. Equipped with an exoskeleton, 
he finds himself facing off against Maddox and several other robots. With remarkable ease, Alex gracefully maneuvers through the crossfire of the robots, neutralizing them one by one. He even tases Maddox as an added measure of victory. Norton and Sellers closely observe the entire training session. Norton emphasizes that although Alex believes he is the one executing these actions, he is merely following programmed commands. Klein raised concerns about the legality of such actions, but Sellers argued that it is permissible for a computer to perceive itself as human within the bounds of the law. Norton drives Alex home, where he meets Clara and David for the first time. David erects a welcome home banner in honor of his father. Alex enters his house, and despite Clara and David's disbelief at his altered appearance, they hug him. A news conference is arranged to introduce the city to the new and improved Murphy. Norton and Kim watch the emotions flowing through Murphy's brain on a monitor as they input the police database information into his head during the setup process. When he recalls his attempted murder, he becomes overwhelmed and starts experiencing a seizure. Dr. Norton apprehends him, urged by Klein and Pope to find a solution quickly. He and Kim decide to reduce Murphy's emotional state. As he walks out, Clara and David are waiting for him. Murphy continues walking with no expression, and David greets his father. He walks past Sellers and the mayor, both of whom extend their hands to him. The audience falls silent as he strides ahead of everyone, scanning the crowd for criminals with warrants. However, the situation takes a negative turn when he spots a man named Thomas King in the crowd, who is wanted for murder. Murphy commands the man to surrender for arrest. Without hesitation, Murphy dives into the crowd and incapacitates King by shooting him with a taser round in the back, causing him to fall down. Pat Novak uses the incident as a catalyst for Rally ING public support behind the new initiative. He highlights how King was in close proximity to two police officers who failed to identify him, and that he had managed to evade arrest for six years despite facing allegations of rape, assault, and murder. In contrast, Alex was able to apprehend him in less than a minute. Consequently, public opinion against the Dreyfus Act begins to shift. The residents of Detroit start embracing Alex and nickname him Robocop, although there are those who oppose the idea, believing that police work should be carried out by human officers rather than robots. However, Sellers instructs Dr. Norton to keep Murphy away from his family for the time being. Murphy arrives at the police station while Chief Dean informs the other officers about several murder suspects. Murphy declares that he will lead the investigation to apprehend a criminal named John Biggs. Mounted on his motorcycle, he patrols the city, eventually capturing a pair of drug-addicted individuals. One of them reveals the whereabouts of Biggs' drug lab. Following the lead, Murphy locates the lab and forcefully enters, eliminating Biggs' henchmen. As Biggs attempts to escape, Murphy corners him. In a desperate move, Biggs tries to throw a grenade at Murphy but is promptly shot in the leg, causing him to drop the explosive and inadvertently detonate it, resulting in his own demise. Clara approaches Alex on the street while he prepares to confront more crime. She pleads with him to listen, revealing that David has been traumatized and is suffering from nightmares. Despite appearing to disregard her, Alex can't ignore the reporters who are hounding Clara and David as she tries to drive him to school. Murphy returns to his house, becoming acutely aware of the growing distance between him and his family. He carefully investigates the crime scene where his car was destroyed, examining the surveillance footage that recorded the explosion. To his astonishment, he discovers that David witnessed the horrifying sight of his burning body. This revelation fills Murphy with fear, anxiety, and deep concern for his son's well-being. Driven by his determination, he resolves to confront Valen once and for all, seeking to bring an end to the threat he poses. To begin, Murphy returns to Jerry White, the gun dealer who initially informed him and Lewis about Valen's involvement in gun trafficking. He chases Jerry down and drags him out of his car to question him. 
Jerry initially resists and attempts to avoid answering until Murphy breaks his hand, forcing him to reveal the identification of a man on Valen's crew with whom he is in touch. Using his access to phone company information, Murphy locates Valen's warehouse. As he rides over to the warehouse, someone alerts Valen about Murphy's approaching arrival. Valen rallies his troops and they take up their weapons. They switch off the lights and put on night vision goggles as an added precaution, attempting to make it more difficult for Murphy to target them effectively. As Murphy rides his motorbike through the doorway, they open fire on him. During the intense attack, Murphy's suit sustains damage and his visor is destroyed. However, he manages to eliminate all of Valen's remaining shooters, with Valen being the last one. Afterward, Murphy retrieves a pistol from one of the fallen troops and scans it for fingerprints. The analysis reveals prints from Lake and Daniels, providing valuable information after taking down Valen. Murphy and Jack both return to the police station. Murphy takes charge of the interrogation of Lake and Daniels, displaying the meeting on all of the station's monitors to establish their involvement in the bombing. During the interrogation, Daniels makes an attempt to shoot Murphy but is quickly shot back and neutralized. Lake reveals that Dean was responsible for both the restaurant firefight and the vehicle bomb. Murphy apprehends Lake and proceeds to confront Dean. However, before Murphy can extract a confession from Dean, Maddox, who operates from the institution, intervenes and shuts Murphy down. Maddox then informs Sellers, who is in his helicopter, about the situation. In another edition of The Novak Element, Novak discusses how Murphy revealed the corruption within the police force, implying why it is finally time to unleash the robots on the streets. Meanwhile, Sellers meets with Maddox, Klein, and Pope to discuss Murphy's health. According to Klein's public statement, Murphy is in critical condition. Sellers determines that they can exploit Murphy as a martyr's emblem to elicit compassion. Furthermore, the Dreyfus Act is abolished. Clara requests to visit her spouse but is refused. Sellers sends Maddox and other mercenaries to destroy Murphy, intending to inform Clara that Alex died as a result of his injuries. Klein arrives at Clara's house and drives her and David to the headquarters to meet with Sellers. Meanwhile, Dr. Norton, with Kim's assistance, breaks into the facility where Murphy is being held, alerting him that the mercenaries have been ordered by Sellers to kill both of them. Murphy awakens just in time to stop the two men from shooting at him and Norton. Murphy drives his motorcycle to Omnicorp headquarters and seeks assistance from Lewis, who has enlisted the support of the SWAT unit. He uses a taser on one of the guards outside the building and orders the others to stand down. He crashes his motorcycle into the structure, attracting the attention of two ED-209 droids. They open fire on Murphy, but he manages to make them shoot at each other. In the chaos, a third droid gets entangled and falls from a significant height, trapping Alex's left arm underneath it. To free himself, Murphy is compelled to use a submachine pistol and blast off his left arm just as more droids arrive. The droids continue firing at him, knocking him down. At that moment, Lewis arrives and stands in front of him, allowing Alex to escape. Maddox and another henchman discover Alex, both wearing red asset bracelets that prevent Murphy from shooting them. However, Lewis shoots Maddox in the back, preventing him from delivering the fatal shot, and then eliminates the other henchman before getting shot, though not fatally. Murphy assesses Lewis' injuries and determines they are not life-threatening. Murphy reaches the rooftop of the building where Sellers is waiting for a helicopter. Clara and David are with him, along with another mercenary, Klein, and Pope. Alex orders the latter two to step aside, and they comply. He attempts to arrest Sellers for his attempted murder but realizes he is also wearing a red asset bracelet, preventing him from shooting. Sellers fires his rifle at Alex, followed by Clara and David. In response, Alex overrides his programming and shoots Sellers, who retaliates. 
Clara and David quickly rush to Alex's side as Seller succumbs to his injuries and dies. Alex is then presented with a newly repaired suit. Clara and David enter the room to see him, and he greets them with a smile. In the final scene, a segment of the Novak element is shown. Norton is set to testify against Omnicorp schemes, and the president will veto the repeal of the Dreyfus Act. However, despite these developments, Novak maintains his pro-robot stance, commending sellers and criticizing Norton for being a whistleblower. Novak concludes his broadcast by urging viewers to stop complaining and embrace the program. 